talk to you today about is uh, what we do in A-level mathematics. I will touch a little bit upon A-level further mathematics, but most of this talk will concentrate on the material of A-level mathematics. So let's get going. We teach A-level mathematics from a particular examination board. It's called Pearson and Excel. The maths, uh, A-level maths, is made out of three components. Two thirds of it, two thirds of the grade, is from what is called pure mathematics. One sixth comes from statistics and one sixth from mechanics. Separate from that, there is an A-level in further mathematics. Also, we take, uh, we go with the uh, Pearson and Excel for that. But here, the uh, relative weights are slightly different. Pure mathematics in this, in further maths, makes up a half of the overall grade. Statistics and mechanics make up a quarter each. Generally speaking, further mathematics is a tougher course and it requires you to know the mathematics content of the full A level in maths. Which is why if you choose to bo uh, study both of these, what we call double mathematics, we teach further mathematics in the second year, having completed all of the mathematics in the first year. So that when you start further mathematics in the second year, you have all the knowledge you need to start. Okay, so that's what we do here in A level mathematics. In year one, we teach the AS course, as it's called, which includes pure and applied, that is statistics and mechanics. So all you'll have a little bit of everything, but at the level of year one. And then in year two, you again have components of everything, but we're going up to a higher level in each of them, in pure, in mechanics and in statistics. As I said, in double mathematics, in year one, we dedicate the entire year to just mathematics. And then at the end of that year, you will be sitting the full A level in mathematics. Based on that, and hopefully when you achieve good grades in that, you will progress to a second year where you do all of further mathematics. And that leads you to a second A level at the end of that year. Guys, if you have any questions while I'm presenting, please say so, okay? I, because I'm using my entire screen to show the presentation, I can't see if you raised your hand electronically. So please just unmute yourselves and say, I have a question, all right? Good. What do you need to know when you come into an A-level maths course? There are three things mostly we want you to know from your prior studies, whether or not you did GCSE, depending on which uh, education system you come from, of course. But what we need you to know, first of all and foremost, is algebra. We need you to know index rules. That is the rules that govern how we raise numbers to powers, how we deal with different things, multiples of powers, powers of powers, dividing two numbers, to different powers. You need to know how to expand and factorize algebraic expressions, and you need to know quadratic curves. In addition to that, we want you to know geometry. Geometry in prior to, to A-level uh, studies, what we assume you know from there, will be knowledge of what lines are, including the gradients, the intercepts, properties of triangles, special types of triangles, what happens when you deal with isosceles and uh, equilateral triangles and so on, quadrilaterals as well, all the, all the shapes with four sides, and circle theorems. Now, I want to make this quite clear. Unlike algebra and trigonometry, which are taught at a higher level in the A-level course, we do not teach geometry at A-level. What this means is what you know and what you need to know in geometry, we are not going to go over again. We are not going to revise or mention anything of that other than to say, you know that 
this happens with this triangle. You know this property of this circle. OK, and you are supposed to know that because, as I say, we don't teach it. Also, we expect you to know trigonometry, basic trigonometry. We want you to know the definitions of sine, cosine and tangent functions of an angle. And that means as defined in a right angle triangle. We are doing a lot of extensions to that and I'm going to get to that starting from the next slide. But this, these three things are the basic three things we need you to know to be comfortable with coming into A level. So if you want to prepare yourself for an A level course in maths, it's a good idea towards the end of the summer to open your books from previous studies and just refresh your memory about these things. OK, so what do we do in the A level in maths? We take some topics that we already you already seen before and we extend them. We take other topics that are completely new to you and teach them from the beginning. An extended topic is, for example, graphs of functions. Now, you know the graphs of functions like parabolas and, of course, straight lines. But we learn how to sketch graphs of what are called cubic functions, uh, functions where you have x cubed as well as x squared x and some numbers. We also deal with quartic equations, which are basically functions where x to the 4 and lower powers of x are included. And the graph on the right hand side here is a graph of a quartic function. The two other graphs here are of a cubic function. We also learn how to transform functions. What you can see with this arrow here leading from the left graph to the middle graph, it's basically the same function, same graph, but we've altered it a bit. We've squeezed it in in the x direction. It's sort of narrower, but we also stretched it out up and down because you can see, for example, the peak that was at plus four here is now at plus eight. So we will learn what operations, and there will be operations in algebra, we need to do in order to achieve such transformations. Here's a new topic. As I said, you are supposed to bring in with you knowledge of geometry. But we are going to approach geometry from a totally different uh, angle, which is coordinate geometry. In other words, we are going to use algebra to solve problems involving lines and circles, for example. Now, there's nothing new, should be nothing new to you from this equation, x squared plus y squared equals 13. That's just an equation of a circle centered around 0, 0. But when we move the circle to a different place, you may end up with an equation that looks like the one I've just shown you. That doesn't look like an equation of a circle that you know, but with algebra, we can make it look like this. And this is very similar to the equation you have there. Only x is replaced by x minus 1 and y is replaced by y plus 2, which is basically to say the center of the circle has moved to another place. It's no longer at 0, 0, as you can see, for example, in this drawing above. So we will learn how to use algebra to deal with what are essentially geometrical problems, but we're not going to teach the geometry underlying it. So, for example, you will need to know that when we have a line like this blue line here, that is tangent to the circle, that is, catches it in only one place, one point, the radius from the center of the circle to that point where the line touches it meets that line at 90 degrees. That's a property that you need to know from before your A-level studies. We're going to assume you know it and we're going to make use of it. You've encountered vectors, I hope, in your previous studies. We're going to extend this topic. We're going to learn how to add and subtract them, multiply them by constants and calculate their length and direction. But we are also going to learn how to solve what are called modeling questions with vectors. 
And what I mean by that, modeling is generally something that goes through a lot of topics in mathematics in A-level. What I mean by it is that we are not going to give you, here is a drawing of a vector, or here is a vector with this I component, with this uh, horizontal component, this vertical component. I'm going to tell you a story. A ship leaves a, a port. It goes northwest with a speed of 20 knots. I have a plane flying. It's going up into the air at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. It's moving at 46, 460 miles per hour. And then I'm going to ask you something about where the plane or the ship will be at a particular point in time. Whether it may or may not hit another object going in a different direction using a different vector. All this will be described to you as a story in words, which is what we call modeling. But we need to then take the information, the mathematical information from it, and work our equations from it using vectors. Okay. Another new topic is called radians. Radians are a new way for you for measuring angles. We are no longer going to just measure angles in degrees. We're going to measure them in what are called radians. A radian, just to let you know in general, is the angle created at the center here between these two radii if the distance along the circle, the arc between point A, where this radius hits the circle, and point B, where this radius hits the circle, is also equal to the radius. So if the distance, not directly in a straight line, but along the circle between A and B, is equal to the radius, the angle in the middle is called a radian. Now this may look very, very odd to you. Why would anybody make such a strange definition? But when we learn radians, we also see how they become very useful in working out certain properties of circles. Another new topic is called exponentials and logarithms. If I asked you what is the solution to the equation 3 to power x is 81, you could work out on paper or in your head even that the powers of 3 are 3 to power 1 is 3, then 9, then 27, and 3 to power 4 is 81. So you would know that x is 4. But if I asked you if 3 to power x is 80, what is x, then that would be very difficult. 80 is not a power of 3. How do we solve that? We don't really solve it. We rely on people who solved it in the past and put the information into the chip in our calculators. But we need to understand how this works. And for this, we introduce a new notation. This new notation is what is written here at the bottom of the screen, which says the logarithm base 3 of 80 is x. This has exactly the same meaning, if you look, if you follow the arrows here, as 3, the base, to power x equals 80, which is what is written above. Now, you would say, quite reasonably, that just writing something in a different way doesn't help me solve it. And that is true. But this notation, this logarithmic notation, will lead us to a whole new set of rules of how to deal with logs of different functions. And these will become very, very useful in other contexts. So this is something we learn for the sake of building on top of it. And in general, everything we do in maths is building one layer at a time. So the information you bring in with you from prior studies, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, if you like, is the base level of our building. And then we start in the first year to build on top of it the first story of a building. And then in the second year, we build second and third stories further up on the building. But each story, each level we build must rely on a very strong level below it. And that's why it's so important that you bring with you good knowledge of mathematics, of basics, when you come in. Shaky bases do not make very good buildings. 
OK, another new topic will be proof. Now, proof is something very, very fundamental to mathematics. Most of mathematics, in fact, is about proving things and seeing whether we can push them further and prove other things based on them. But this is something we haven't really done much of up to now. And unlike other parts of the curriculum in A-level, where you learn a particular method and then we want you to apply that method, in proof, there are many different methods. So we learn a few of them, but in general, every proof is different. There is not going to be a formula that you say, ah yes, to prove this, here is a formula. That's what I do. These are the steps I do. In, often, in most cases, you will need, quite often, you will need to think of a proof right from the start and say, OK, how do I get this? How do I prove that? Obviously, we will show you some examples of how to prove things that will give you ideas on how to approach other proofs. What are we going to prove? We're going to prove claims such as there is an infinity of prime numbers. It may look like a very difficult thing to prove. Infinity is not something we can ever get to the end of. So how do you know that there is an infinity of prime numbers? Maybe it's just a very big number of prime numbers. We can prove that, in fact. You will learn how to do that. We can also prove that it is not true that all prime numbers are odd. But this is a much easier proof. This is a proof where it's enough to find one number that is prime and isn't odd. And then we proved not all prime numbers are odd. This is called proof by counterexample. You just bring one example and say, OK, the claim is not correct. OK. We also will learn how to prove that the product of any three consecutive positive integer numbers is divisible by three. So numbers like 5, 6, and 7, or 102, 103, and 104. If you multiply those three together, any three that come right after each other, the product of those three is divisible by three. But again, we need to prove it for any three consecutive positive numbers. We can't just say, oh, it works for 5, 6, and 7, and it works for 3, 4, and 5, therefore it is correct. We have to prove it for everything. And that's why we need to find a general proof, not one that relies on particular examples. And finally, we will learn that root 2 is, in, is an irrational number. A rational number is any number that we can write as a fraction, like 7 over 8 or 2 over 17. The square root of 2 cannot be written as a simple fraction. And we can show that. And that's why it's called an irrational number. So all of these will require different ideas, different techniques, different approaches to prove. Some of them, like I said, like proving that not all prime numbers are odd, are going to be fairly easy. You just go through a few examples, you find one example that really doesn't work with the claim, and you say, therefore, the claim is incorrect. Some of them will be similar to things you've done in class, to the point that you will be able to say, ah, yes, all I need to do is take what I did in class and change a few things, and I've got myself the new proof. And some of them will require a little bit more thinking. OK. Proof does not take up a lot of what we do in A-level mathematics. But if you plan to study mathematics beyond A-level at university, you will find that your course is almost exclusively proofs. So it's a very good idea to know how to prove things. Another extended topic is trigonometry. As I said before, you need to know the basic properties of trigonometric functions in a, uh, defined in the right angle triangle, sine, cosine and tangent. The first thing we do in our course in A-level is to say inside a right angle triangle, all the angles are smaller or equal to 90 degrees. So really, you only know how to deal 
with sine, cosine and tangent of angles between 0 and 90 degrees. But we want to extend this. We want to know what happens with these functions when the angle is bigger than 90 degrees. Maybe 120 degrees, maybe 230 degrees, maybe even 350 degrees. And we will show you that you can actually extend the definitions and work with any angle at all, including negative angles and very, very large angles. We will find a way that works with these functions. Then we will introduce you to new trigonometric functions. As two of them are mentioned at the bottom of this page. Second is one over cosine, cosecant is one over sine. We will learn how to manipulate these functions. We will learn that some of them have very interesting connections between them. And we will use all of this information to solve equations. Equations such as 3 times sine of 4 theta plus 25 degrees equals 2. We will learn how to prove this identity. If you look carefully, there are three lines here, not two. It's not an equal sign. It's an identity sign. What it means is that when I take an angle, any angle theta, and I take the sine of it and square it, and to this I add the square of the cosine of the same angle, I will get one. Doesn't matter what the angle is. That's why it is identity. No matter what the angle is, this is always one. We will learn this, we will actually prove this, and we will learn how to use this to solve other equations. And then using some of our new functions, like the second here, we will solve equations like this. And you note here, not just that we're using second, and not just that it is squared, but the angle inside it is two theta, whereas the angle inside the tangent is theta. It's not even the same angle between the two functions. And yet we will learn how to deal with such equations. Something you may or may not be familiar with from trigonometrics, uh, from trigonometric studies earlier on, is the sine rule and the cosine rule. We will teach those rules. Not everybody learns them prior to coming to A-level, so they are part of the A-level curriculum as well. But again, unlike previous cases where you apply them to really simple triangles, we will learn to apply them in very different situations which require more thinking, problems that are more difficult to solve. We also learn how to use the sine function as part of calculating an area of a triangle. You need to know, of course, that you can calculate the area of triangles by multiplying half times the base times the height, but this will be a new formula with which we can use the, or we can calculate the area of a triangle even if we don't know the height from the base. As I mentioned before, modeling is a very important concept and we are going to use modeling also in trigonometry. So here is a problem. The height of water in a harbor t hours after midnight on January 1st is given by this function. This looks like a really scary function. But in fact, if you look at it carefully, the height h is simply the number 5 plus 3 times the sine of some angle. The angle is complicated, true. It involves t, the time. So obviously as t changes, the angle will change and sine will change. Okay, but we will learn how to deal with these functions. And now we want to know at what time will the water level be above seven meters? So we need to think water level. Water level is H, right? So I want H bigger than seven. So what do I really want to solve? I want to solve when does this expression, five plus three times the sine of this angle, when is this bigger than seven? Ah, so I need to solve an inequality. Right. That gives me a mathematical context. And now, using my knowledge of how to solve trigonometric equations, I will be able to solve the inequality. 
but this is a simple demonstration of how the description of a problem is given to you in words and you need to use mathematics, the mathematics in it, draw it out and write the equations or inequalities that you need in order to solve the problem. One of the major new topics of A-level mathematics is called calculus. Calculus is a collective name that includes two things. One is differentiation, the other one is integration. In differentiation, we start by learning how to calculate the gradient of a curve. Now, that is not an obvious concept. When you have a straight line, like the blue line here in this graph, the upper graph, you know that there always is the same gradient. The line is always going with the same gradient. And the gradient basically tells you how much you will change y with every step in x. If I increase x by 1, by how much will y go up or down? That is my gradient. But the curve quite clearly doesn't stay the same. That's why it is a curve, not a straight line. So what is the meaning of the gradient of a curve? To understand this, we will draw a line, not like this blue line, but slightly to the right of it, a line that only touches the curve at one point. The gradient of that line at that point will be the gradient of the curve at that point. But clearly, if I have a line that touches the curve here, it will have one gradient, and if it touches the curve here at zero, zero, it will have to be horizontal. It's a totally different line. And any line in between the two at different points will again be different from those two. So what it means is that the curve has a gradient that keeps changing all the time. How to calculate those gradients without working out this time after time with different points is what we call differentiation. Okay. The differentiation basically tells you what the gradient will be at any point on the curve. And that allows you to tell how fast or slow will y change with x, what we call the rate of change of the function at different points. What do we use differentiation for? Of course, we're going to use it for modeling. Imagine the following problem. I'm giving you a certain amount of, let's say, uh, some flexible material, like uh, very thin cardboard. And I'm asking you, or paper, and I'm asking you to create from it a box. The box needs to be made of a cylinder, like here. And on top of the cylinder, we have a hemisphere, half of a, uh, of a sphere. Okay, with the same radius as the base of the uh, cylinder. But you only have the amount of paper I gave you. So what you can do, of course, is make it thin and tall, or you can perhaps use the same amount of paper to make it shorter but wider. My question to you is, with the same amount of paper, what is the cylinder, what is the shape, the box you can make that has the biggest volume, that can take the biggest amount of matter inside it? Now, that's not an easy problem to solve. Okay. For this, we will see that we can define the volume as a function, a function of the radius, of the base, and of the height of the cylinder, using the fact that we only have a certain amount of paper to play with, we will then say, OK, but the height and the radius are not completely free for us to choose. If I make it taller, the radius will have to shrink because I don't have enough paper to make it bigger. So the height and the radius will depend on each other, and that dependence will simplify our function for the volume, which we will then use a differentiation for to find where that function has its maximum or minimum value. Okay, this may sound very, very abstract to you right now, 
and it's not surprising if it is, but this tells you, just gives you an idea of the power that modeling with differentiation can have. Okay, this is the kind of problems you will be solving quite easily once you've learned this material. More generally, we need to learn how to differentiate different functions. So we learn, for example, trigonometric functions, exponentials, logarithmic functions. We learn how to differentiate these functions. That notation d divided by dx is actually called d 2 dx. It's not a division. This is not a fraction. This is just the way we write differentiation of the function inside the brackets. So the differentiation of sine x actually turns out to be cosine of x. And we will show that. You will learn how to do this, what is called from first principles, how to use the basic proof to show that. We will learn that if we have e, e is a very special number, a bit like pi, and e is raised to power kx, where k is some number and x is a variable, and we differentiate it with respect to x, what we get is almost exactly the same thing, but we have another k, the same k, multiplying it on the outside. So if we had e to power 3x, its derivative, as we call it, differentiating it, will give us three times e to the 3x. And again, we will learn why that is. Then we will learn some rules of differentiation rules that allow us to combine different functions in different ways. What happens when we have two functions multiplying each other? How do we differentiate that? How do we differentiate one function divided by another function, or even one function to the power of another function, like we have here, function of a function? This looks horrible, but you will learn how to do even this complicated thing and how to differentiate it. As I mentioned earlier, we have two aspects in calculus. The other one is integration. Integration, initially we introduce it as the opposite operation to differentiation. So if differentiation of one function gave you a second function, integration of the second function will take you back to the first function, more or less. We will learn exactly where it's not quite exact. Okay. So we will learn how to integrate various functions. And using a variety of techniques, we will extend it to very, very complicated functions. For example, we will learn how to work out the area enclosed by a curve and a line or by two curves. OK, so if, for example, you look at the graph on the right here. And I want to know what's the area between the curve and the x-axis, this area here, integration techniques will allow you to calculate this area exactly. Okay, We do it by, if you look at what is happening on the left graph, by thinking of very thin slices from the curve down to the x-axis and adding them together, but making the slices so thin that they're actually zero width. So they become not just approximate to the curve, they become exactly the area under the curve. But all this we learn in practice how to do when we learn uh, to deal with integration. We also learn how to deal with parametric curves, which are curves described not by y equals some function of x, but both x and y are described by another parameter, as we call it, another variable. So think for a minute of somebody leaving his house and walking along a curve. At time t, the position of this person along the curve is given by his x-coordinate is t squared plus t and his y-coordinate is root of t minus 3. It doesn't really tell us how y is related to x. But if I want to know where I am, what the curve looks like, all I need to do is take t from zero and start increasing it and see what is the x, y value for this t. 
what is the xy value for that t? And that will give me the curve. We can work out, therefore, where this person will be at any time and find the direction in which this person is heading at any time. And using differentiation, we can even work out how fast the man is going at any time. Okay, slightly more theoretical, again, is the topic of functions. We use the word function very freely. You, if I asked you what a function was, you'd probably be able to give me lots and lots of examples. But it would be difficult for you, I think, to give me an exact definition of what a function is. So we define functions properly, and we think about how they work, they take numbers from certain group of numbers, which are called the domain, and they give results in what is called the range. We also discover what condition we require for a function to have an inverse function. That is a function that does exactly the opposite, not takes you from x to y, but back from that y to the original x. We learn how to compose, oops, sorry about that. We learn how to compose a combination of several functions. And we introduce the inverse trigonometric functions. Those that take us not from x to y equaling sine of x, but the other way around. Arc sine and arc cosine are those that take you in the other direction. Finally, the last topic on uh, pure mathematics is sequences and series. Again, you are familiar generally with the concept of a sequence of numbers with a rule that tells you how to go from one number to the next. OK, but we learn this much more de uh, deeply, specifically with arithmetic and geometric sequences where we add a constant or multiply by a constant. But then again, we apply them not just to pure mathematical problems, but also to modeling problems. For example, if I borrow 10,000 pounds and pay annual interest of 5%, but pay back 1,000 pounds at the end of each year, in how many years will I clear the debt completely? Not easy. Every year I pay back 1,000, but my debt increases because I pay interest. So the interplay between what I have to pay more and what I've already paid and pay again at the end of each year is what will decide how many years it takes me to clear the debt. And we will learn how to do that. So what we've seen so far in quite a long time is pure mathematics. And as I told you, pure mathematics is two thirds of your whole A level. So that takes up the majority of our time. But there are two other aspects. The first of them is statistics. In statistics, which again is something you know a little bit about from previous studies, we learn some new things and some things that you've already touched on before, but extend them. We learn sampling methods. If we want to take a sample of people and ask them a question, because we simply don't have the time and money to go and ask everybody in the world the same question, then exactly how do we choose these people? I want to ask 100 people, but I want the answer to be rele relevant to pretty much everybody else. How do I know that those 100 people really represent the population? So we will learn how to take what are called sampling methods, and we will learn the advantages and disadvantages of each one. Once we've collected the data, we've asked them questions, we got information, we will learn how to deal with data, to handle data. We have numbers, for example, we collect people's heights or weights or their grades in a particular exam. And we want to know where is the middle of the data set? What is sort of a representative number for the whole data set? And how much of the data are spread out around the middle? Is the average height of a group of people 1 meter 80? Fine, but are they all around 1 meter 80? close to it or are they some of them one meter 50 and some of them two meter 10 we need to know that that will give us a measure of the spread of the data around me 
We will also describe data visually using what are called box plots and histograms. And then we will look at what are called correlation and regression, where we have more than one thing. For example, the height and the weight of people, or as the example in the graph shows, the score in a physics test and in a mathematics test. And we want to know, is there a link between the two? Should we think of a link between the two? Do they look like they go together? More specifically, we will be looking at straight line links. We're not looking for this graph of points to describe something like a curve. We will be asking whether they are linearly correlated, these two variables. And if they are properly correlated linearly, what is the best line that we can draw through the data that is called regression to describe that link? We will deal with probability. I'm sure you've come across probability before. We will extend it again. We will deal with Venn diagrams, as in the upper graph. We will be dealing with tree diagrams, as in the lower diagram, the lower graph. But we will be applying them to complex situations, such as conditional probabilities. If I know that something already happened, what is the probability of something else also happening, and so on. We will extend our knowledge of probability by looking at probability distributions. Which means that in some situations, the probabilities of all possible outcomes of an experiment can be put into a formula. Now you may think, well, what's the big deal? I can just write down all the outcomes and work it out. But just imagine that I'm throwing a coin a hundred times and asking how many times I got heads. Well, there are 101 different options here. I could be getting heads zero or one or two or three or all the way up to 100 times. Do we really want to work out by hand 101 different probabilities? That's a lot of work. So if we can find a model that will give us a formula where we can calculate any probability of these 101 directly, that would be great. So specifically, we're going to deal with two special distributions. In the binomial distribution, we are answering questions such as, if we throw a fair die 20 times, what is the probability that it will land with a number four facing up more than 10 times? Okay, so we have a fixed number of uh, attempts to achieve a particular result. We want to achieve it at least 10 times. What's the probability of that? We also will be dealing in the second year with a normal distribution. And the normal distribution is used for large data sets. And where we think of the data as continuous. It has very special properties and we will use them to solve very difficult problems. I mean, problems that are very difficult to solve without these techniques. Our most advanced topic in statistics is going to be hypothesis testing. So imagine that we threw that coin that we talked about earlier 20 times, and we got 14 times tails and only six times heads. Does that mean that the coin is not really fair? That it's not got the same probability of heads and tails? Or do we say, well, you know what, 14, then that's possible. That could happen, even with a perfectly fair coin. And if I think that's OK, then what about 15? What about 16? At what point do I draw the line and say, you know what, I think there's something wrong with this coin. It lands on one side far too many times. What we will see is that there is no clear answer to this question. The answer will depend on how certain we want to be, what is called our significance level. And this will say, OK, actually, I want to be this this much certain, and therefore I need it to be no more than 16 times heads or tails in order for me to say the coin is OK. It's just, you know, happened by chance. 
This is called hypothesis testing. And again, we will learn how to use in hypothesis testing the models of the distributions we worked with before. So we build on them the ability to test hypotheses. Lastly, we have mechanics where we bring together knowledge from pure mathematics and the ability to analyze verbose questions, such as you will find quite a lot in statistics, questions with lots of words. And in addition to that, a new set of terms and laws that govern the motion of objects in Newtonian mechanics. So mechanics really brings everything together, if you like. The first thing we will, sorry, again, jumped a little bit too far. The first thing we will deal with is kinematics, which is the study of how objects move. We will looking at ob we'll be looking at objects that move with constant acceleration, and we will have several equations that describe how they move, in what what is the speed over time, where they are, or the position over time. Then we will extend it to variable acceleration, acceleration that changes itself over time. And we will see that in order to solve this type of problem, we will need to use differentiation and integration. So we will be using those topics from pure. We will then move to look at dynamics, which is why an object is moving the way it does, not just how it moves like we did before, but why. And then we will learn in Newtonian mechanics, it is due to forces acting on the object and we will learn Newton's laws which tell us how these forces affect the object's movement in a quantitative way. We'll also deal with issues of moments. These are questions of balancing things. So if you will imagine that we have a plank of wood, this horizontal line in our drawing, and we pull it with a force five newtons here and another force three newtons there, but it's got a weight four newtons there, and we put some support here at point P, and we ask, will it turn around P? And if so, will it turn clockwise or anticlockwise? Moments will help us answer that question. We will deal with projectiles as well, which are objects that we throw typically into the air, and they are moving under gravity. So for imagine, imagine for a minute uh, a basketball or a netball that you throw from the player to the basket, to the hoop, and you think, well, actually it's moving across, it needs to cover this distance to the basket, but it also goes up and down, and it needs to be at the right height to enter the hoop. So we're looking at motion in two dimensions. And that is what projectiles and the equations we're dealing with will be doing for us. But we will discover very quickly that for this, we will be using the equations we developed earlier in kinematics. So again, we're building on what we did before. We will revisit vectors. Only this time, the vectors will describe specifically velocity and acceleration of objects moving in two dimensions. Okay. We will, be we will be able to predict, therefore, whether two objects will be on a collision course or not. So, in summary, A-level mathematics is a demanding course. I'm not going to pretend for a minute that it's a walk in the park. We will be covering a lot of material in each academic year, and this means that you will need to work hard both in class and at home. You will be getting a lot, and I do mean a lot of homework. The amount of time you spend at home doing the homework and revising the material will be more or less the same amount of time you spend in class. And you need to take this into account. If what you heard so far interests you and you're willing to put in the required effort, we will be very, very pleased to see you taking A-level maths with us from September. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Guys, any questions? 
A level, Trina, is A level math? Sorry, uh, can you just make one moment? I'll see if I can see it on the chat. Yes, is A level math required for those wishing uh, to pursue medicine? Well, I think, I don't know if it's a requirement, I'll need to look it up, but I think it is definitely going to help you. Yes. Anybody else? Any questions? You can unmute yourselves and talk, or you can use the chat, guys. No? Okay, guys, then Thank you very much for attending and I very much hope that you learned quite a bit about what A-level maths is and that it actually interests you and you will join us in September. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thanks.